Well, hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to our Red Letter Study. I hope you were encouraged and blessed by the series. The series. Three, two. Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to our Red Letter Study. I hope you were blessed and encouraged by the sermon series on the Upper Room Discourse. And as I said in the beginning of it all, um, we're going to conclude with little capsules like this, back to the red letter type format. But these are two last sessions which I never got to preach. This is this is privilege for you. This is the first time ever been heard by anyone. <laughs> so we have to at least remember two main things, I would say, a lot more, but two main things when approaching this upper room discourse. The first being that this is for the apostles, the 11 men that Jesus was preparing so they could turn the world upside down, to get some the foundation that is the church. It's for them, first, first and foremost. And this doesn't mean it's not for us also. It just means we start with them and then we try to glean for ourselves. The second thing is the many contrasts that Jesus keeps using over and over again, a bit like light and darkness. He's mentioned how um, you know, the, the world will be against them and they'll be left to themselves and Jesus is going to leave them alone. They're going to be hated by the world. But on the flip side, the light side, the comforter will live in them. This is the way the Father and the Son, God himself, will live in them. And if they abide in Christ, they trust in his name when they come to the Father, they will be taken care of by God himself. So that's the encouraging aspect. Another contrast, of course, the one between this world that hates them and God, the kingdom of light that is for them. And that contrast keeps going through this upper room as well. So having these two things in mind, we, we come to a session I've entitled A Little While. Because that's like the phrase, the idea that it's going to pop like popcorn in this great conversation, discussion, trying to understand what does it mean? I mean, Jesus simply mentioning it to the disciples, discussing it to Jesus, then elaborating, and there's a sense where you're not sure what it really means. We have to be careful not to think, they didn't get it, but <laughs> I got it. No, because it, Jesus stays coy, stays vague. Even when he answers, you're not sure what is he saying by this. We have to keep that in mind. There's possibilities, but we are not sure. What we want to focus on is what seems sure, and what's important for us, like I said, as it was important for them. We begin with a transitional voice, uh, verse. After he's talked about the coming of the Spirit, encouragement, by which he will convict people of sin, uh, of judgment, and of course of justice. After he's, he's done that, he then turns back to the disciples to talk to them about their reality. And he says this in verse 16. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. This leaves us with so many questions. What does it mean by a little while? And is it the exact same amount of time the first time? Then in the second time? Now, I don't think so, and most don't either. But then it also brings us back to what does it mean by you will not see, you will see me no longer and then you will see me? Most probably he's referring, first of all, a little while in the sense that very soon he will become be, be taken by the religious leaders to be crucified and buried. He will be gone. And this will happen in, in matters of hours right now. So in a little while, he will be gone. They won't see him anymore. In a full, complete sense, he will be buried and dead. But then it takes us to the next point that's a bit more difficult. How long is this second little while, and how will they see him? One possibility is that he's, he's again talking about the fact of his resurrection, and the 40 days he's going to pass with them. But I don't think that's the answer. I could be wrong. But when you go back to the beginning of the upper room, and he mentions something very similar to that, but as a piece of information. 
Yeah, here's what he says. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. Take notice, the world. But you will see me, because I live, you also will live. The world won't see you, but they will. This part referring to that moment when he comes back 40 days with them and only them. Right? The coming back was only for the disciples. Nobody else in the world saw him. Even the Roman soldiers at the tomb didn't take the sieges rise up. They just saw the angel. They saw the, uh, they, they realized that after it was empty, but they never saw the risen Jesus. Only the disciples did. Not the world, just them. So this is probably referring to that. But then, if I go back to our first verse, it doesn't mention this idea that the world won't see. This seeing of Jesus seems to be beyond the idea of just the world not seeing him. Or just them seeing him. That's why there are the two possibilities. The other two, well, first of all, he's talking about the Spirit coming to live inside of them. He told them, when the Spirit comes, in chapter 14, it will be like Christ living in them. Right? The, the spiritual eyes, they will see Christ. And everybody who becomes believers, when the Spirit comes inside of us, He opens our eyes to see the beauty of the cross, like Paul says in 2 Corinthians. So in that sense, they see with spiritual eyes, Jesus, all of those who become believers. That could be one possibility. By the Spirit, they will see Him. Another one. He said he's referring to His second coming. When he's going to come back in great power, all will see him, especially the disciples, right? And there's even a sense of when he comes to get us, to bring us to be with him forever, in preparation for the new Jerusalem. That could be part of that second coming aspect that he could be referring to. So, first one, he's talking about the 40 days, which I don't think so. Second one, by the Spirit, and the third one, his second coming. Let's keep reading. Because then we see that the disciples are just as confused as we could be right now. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me again. Uh, you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father. I think note of two things here. First, they're not questioning Jesus. The upper room discourse started with them asking him questions to make sense of what he's saying. Right? Philip asked questions and Thomas asked questions. But here they're asking among themselves. It's like they're, they're, they're to a point of they're afraid not to ask him. Or they don't get it and they don't want to look stupid to ask him. Whatever the reason, they're not asking Jesus. They're trying to figure it out by themselves, which is kind of what we're doing here. Now, the second thing, which is kind of interesting, is they didn't stop with that phrase we just read in verse 16. They added a new one, because I'm going to the Father. That he also said in chapter 14, in the beginning, when he said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. They, they're stuck on this. Not the greater works, like some do, but this. He's going to the Father. We won't see him. We will see him, but he's going to the Father, though. So they're confused by how can he be going to the Father and we still be able to see him? So they're pushing it way further. Of course, they don't know about his resurrection, but still, they're pushing it to that point right here. And I don't think it's for nothing that they're reasoning like that, and that reasoning is given to us by the narrator, by the Holy Spirit that they saw fit to connect these two ideas. This is maybe God hinting at this is all about Jesus living for good and only coming back at the end of the age. But I digress. I could be wrong. So, they're questioning themselves and they've added a little extra this idea of going to the Father and they're still very confused. So, in that confusion, John adds, so they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what it is, what he is talking about. I like that that's the focus. It's not about him going to the Father or him being away. How long is that going to be? Okay, we're going to lose him. 
But how long until we see him again? So there's no focus on seeing Jesus, being with Jesus. That's their main idea. How long is it a while? Is it our high cry as well? How long, O oh Lord, until you come back? Maranatha, like Paul writes. Is that our high cry? I dare us. What does it mean, a little while? How long is this going to be? This is when Jesus, knowing all things, pipes up. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourself? What I meant by saying, A little while, then you will not see me. And again, a little while, then you will see me. I love how this is the third time we're going back to that one phrase. That phrase that started it all, keeps getting repeated. The disciples repeat it. Jesus repeats it. And yet, we don't really have an answer. And you'll see, by the end of our conversation, our, our study, we'll see we won't have a clear, concise, this is what I mean. This phrase means this, and this phrase means that. No, Jesus is not going to do that. It's a confusing idea, and we won't have the full answer of it. But still, Jesus is going to use their confusion, their question, to open up the door and try to explain something. And in Jesus' style, it, it means with more truth. Yeah. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Again, it's the contrast between um, the world and them. The world rejoices while they're weeping and lamenting. Of course, this will be the first little while when Jesus is gone. But that will be changed, of course. As he says, the sorrowful will turn into joy for the disciples now. The world will rejoice, but then it will be their turn. Now, it's interesting that he doesn't say, he doesn't say and the world will be sorrowful then. So, again, we want to be careful for what Jesus is saying. But it is fascinating that he is piling on the negative comments, right? Weeping, and lamenting, and sorrowful. Three different words of suffering and pain and emotional struggle for that one word of joy. It's like he's trying to dip the scale on one side saying, look how bad this is, this earthly reality, without me. But then I just put that joy part. And we're going to understand it's a very special joy. And it's going to completely destroy the scale on the other side. This is like Paul in 2 Corinthians again. Talking about our earthly bodies being destroyed, but our inner man being renewed. And talking about how those momentary afflictions are going to produce an internal way of glory. So it's, it's, the balance is so broken because of it. Because of this eternal way of glory. So this is joy. This is what he says, and he's going to try to explain that with a parable. Typical Jesus. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow. Because her, her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Now here we don't have to do the contrast between world and not world. This is the parable. A mini parable about the idea of a woman who is suffering, right? Um, sorrow. And has anguish. Again, two words about suffering. For that one word of joy, because of this baby coming to be born. Right? That the work coming to fruition. That's when he's kind of hinting at him and pointing to, right? And all that work that's sorrowful and difficult and pain, a bit like in Romans, where this world is is groaning until the children of God are revealed. That's why everything is brought into a glorified state. But right now, all of creation is groaning for it. Like she is groaning until that, that moment of Again, that one word, joy, comes to be. But at this point, we still have the answer, though. What do you mean by a little while, you won't see? All that he's trying to make you understand right now is, it will be difficult without me, but there is going to be something great at the end. This is more and more why I'm leading towards the last option of his great return, or him coming to get us to be with him until that last great return of being with him forever. And especially when you continue, and Jesus adds, so also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, 
and no one will take your joy from you. So again, he's hinting at the idea of right now, as I'm saying this, the idea of maybe losing me, you have sorrow. But you will see me again. And it will bring joy to your heart. And it's a joy that no one can take away. See, this is why I, it, it could be the joy of the Spirit in us, but the fact is this joy of the Spirit, even if it's powerful, it's God, it's the fruit of the Spirit, it could be effective, right? We still have moments of despondency and discouragement and despair. Even Paul went through it. It seems to be shaken, not taken, but shaken. But what he's talking about is a joy that's unmovable. It seems almost perfect, which is more why he leaned towards the last option. But still, it, it, it is a joy of God he's talking about. It's something greater to, to look forward to than the reality of right now, even if it seems very difficult, what Jesus is saying to them and what they'll be going through, what we're going through. Jesus adds to this. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now, this part, the beginning of verse 23, seems to me to be connected more to verse 22. Because here he talks about truly, truly, that means I have more truth to tell you. I believe it's connected back to verse 22, where we, we saw this idea of having this full joy that can't be taken away from them when they see him again, which I keep saying will probably be, is, is most probably hinting at this eternal state with him. And in that day, there's nothing more to ask. And in that day, there's more questions to have. But it could also refer to the idea of having the Spirit, the Spirit renewing our minds. As he promised in chapter 14, when the Spirit comes, He will teach you all things. Everything I didn't teach you, he will add. He will have it. We have it. It's, it's in the New Testament. Right? The writings of Paul, and Peter, James, and John, given to us by the Spirit. But there's no more questions then. Still, when the fact that he says there, there won't be any more questions to ask, to me, points more to that state where we're just going to see him as is, and there's no more questions to be had. But I could be wrong. Well, we know he's, he's going to keep explaining it, with more truth by telling them that now they can ask the Father and the Father will take care of them. Something he has been saying all through the Upper Room Discourse about turning to the Father and trusting he'll provide for them. So even though on earth it's difficult for you guys, it'll be sorrow and your ultimate hope is a joy that can't be moved in between. There's prayer. It's like Paul telling the Philippians, right? Don't worry, be anxious about anything. But in all things, means there will be anxieties and difficulties. You pray. You supplicate God. And He'll keep your mind and your heart on Christ. So you, you will have anxieties type situations, but you turn to pray, which is what Jesus is, is offering them. You'll have sorrow. Your ultimate hope is what is to come, a joy untouchable. But you have prayer to help you get through all the way to that point. And he really hits it home, this power of prayer, by saying, until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. So this is where you can come back to, it, it is the second option. The joy of the Spirit. The Spirit that can be shaken and moved, but never fully uh, taken out, because it's rooted. And God, Christ, is rooted in us. And, and, and when it starts to be drowned out by the anxieties and fear, that's when you pray and the Spirit emboldens you and we encourages you and joy comes back again. Because what God does is bring you back to Christ and encourages you through that. But this idea of this, uh, this incredible joy, uh, fullness of joy, is something, again, Jesus talked about in the beginning. Actually, chapter 15, when he said, these things, the things about abiding in him, trusting in his finished work, in that way you uh, pray in his name, you, you trust in his finished work on the cross. I come to you, Father, because of what Jesus did. That's the only way I can come to you. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. What is the joy of Christ? 
is the joy of being fully, infinitely, perfectly loved by the Father. And nothing can take away that love the Father has for the Son. That's the fullness of joy that He's giving us because we are in the Son now. Because we hide in His Sonship, in His righteousness. And because of that, we're fully loved of the Father as Christ is fully loved. And that love never changes. Can't change. Because God doesn't change. Because His love for the Son never changes. That's amazing joy. Well, amazing joy will be complete and total when we enter into His presence because of what Christ did. But I hope at this point you're realizing how even though we don't know exactly what he meant by uh, a little while you will see me, we still understand what he's hinting at. This life will be difficult, filled with pain and suffering. Prayer is the tool by which you will be strengthened and helped and encouraged and bear fruit, like fruit of joy. But of course, the ultimate end is this joy that can be moved. That's why I continue to land on this eternal hope. But this then brings us back to asking the question, what does it mean for us? Because we're not the 11. But we still have the same promise. We will see Christ, ultimately, fully and perfectly, in the Jerusalem. Is that what we look to? Is that our great hope? Are our prayers so focused on fix my problem now, and not enough about just get me to that moment when I see you face to face. Keep me in joy now, no matter the situation, that yes, please fix, if you will, but keep me in joy now until I taste that joy forever with you. I believe that's what Jesus is hinting at. I could be wrong, but I believe this is exactly in line with what Jesus usually teaches his disciples and what they would need before he does go away. And that no brothers and sisters be blessed.